It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly and sometimes twice weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, it's been a busy week, and I think that's provoked a lot of good questions from listeners. And so I had a bunch uh, piled up here to get to. And so I figured we'd do a second episode of Herd Mentality this week. And again, it gives us the opportunity to get into some of the hot button issues around this football team. Offensive line, Kyir Elam, backup quarterback, all the good stuff and some really cool angles that I get to attack this discussion from today. Now, I do want to tell you before we start, uh, I am going to be on the Bleacher Report app quite a bit moving forward, including over the next few days. So would encourage you to download the Bleacher Report app. If you follow me on there, at Joe underscore Marino, uh, you'll be fully aware of whenever I go live. But just to let you know what's coming up, Thursday at 5 o'clock p.m., I'm going to do a live stream where I discuss the bubble players on the roster and I talk about who's in and who's out. So would love you to join and interact in the chat. Then Saturday, right after the Bills-Bears preseason game, I'm going to hop in there for my immediate reaction, my winners and losers from the game. And then the 29th, right after the Buffalo Bills final roster cuts are announced, I'm going on Bleacher Report Live to discuss all of that. And we just talked about September. I'm going live after every game immediately. We have some midweek shows as well. So if you want more content, check out Bleacher Report and make sure you follow me on there at Joe underscore Marino. We're going to be on there quite a bit, and it's a great opportunity for me to interact with more Bills fans and uh, just add more to the portfolio of work that I do. So really thankful to Bleacher Report and uh, hopefully you'll join me and show up in the chat and interact and have some fun over there. All right, let's uh, let's get to these outstanding questions. First one here comes from Scott. Scott says, how much of Kyer Elam's issues can be tied to a change in defensive coordinator? We know this can be true of quarterbacks and we know the game can be very complex. Is it more mental or physical with Elam? Is there not enough physical flashes for a first-round pick? In the run-up to the draft, Lockdown listeners were more focused on other options like Tariq Wolin. What were your perceived weaknesses of his college football tape, and are you seeing the same weaknesses on his NFL tape? Really good stuff here uh, from Scott. Uh, First of all, thanks for mentioning Tariq Wolin. I talked about him being a first-round option for the Bills a couple of times, And then this dude falls to like the fifth round and becomes an outstanding cornerback right away for Seattle. So I don't don't know what to tell you there. No clue what happened uh, with the NFL and why they didn't draft Tariq Wolin way higher than the fifth round. But uh, to the root of your question, do you do I see issues with Kyer Elam that uh, could be tied to a shift in defensive coordinator? And I don't think that his issues are tied to a change in defensive coordinator. And I think that's a fair talking point. I think. A lot of times you turn over coaches and that really leaves players behind in a lot of ways. But because you really only turned over the coordinator, you still have the same position coach. Um, You still have Sean McDermott. I I think conceptually so much that exists right now carries over, and I don't think it's putting him behind. Now, I do think it's fair to say that Kyer Elam proved last year that he's a much better player than what we've seen so far in preseason. I mean, down the stretch, he made some really big-time plays. I don't know that the Bills beat the Dolphins in the playoffs without him, 
Thought he played well against Cincinnati. Huge play against Kansas City, picking off uh, Patrick Mahomes in the end zone. You know, he he had some really good moments last year, and I was very optimistic about him going into this season. And so I do think it's fair to us acknowledge to acknowledge that hey, this dude was a lot better than he's showcasing right now. And one thing that has recently come to mind, and it actually was provoked uh, when I was on uh, a podcast this past week, I was a guest on AJ's analysis as part of the Buffalo Rumblings podcast feed, and it reminded me of a story that may um, click with you guys and uh, discuss maybe what's going on with Kyer Elam. And the story is like this. About 10, 15 years ago, I had a different job, and I was a um, an account manager. And we had a big account, uh, the company that I worked for did, and we were very nervous about losing it. And so the ownership came to me and said, Joe, we'd like you to take over this account and see if you can save it. And so I went into this with a lot of uh, energy to try to do that, right? I wanted to save this account. I wanted to prove that I could make this work, make them happy and retain the account. And I was, I'd like to think I was very good at my job. I worked really hard and applied myself and was, you know, I had advanced within the company. I, I would agree that I was the right person to take over the account. And they had somebody on on that account that was very, very difficult to work with that I had to make happy. And so I, the pressure that I had to do this um, didn't, didn't lead to me being very successful initially. And in fact, the the person that was the difficult person to deal with um, wound up kind of calling me and saying, Joe, what's going on? Like you were supposed to come in and be better. It's not been better. What's happening? And I wound up saying to her, like just being completely vulnerable that I'm very sorry and that I feel a lot of pressure to do a good job here. And I want to take care of you very, very well. Um, but I'm trying so hard to do a good job that I just can't stop making mistakes. And I'm, I'm just not the best version of myself right now. And I'm really sorry. And you know, I'm going to slow down and try to make sure that I'm doing things uh, correctly as opposed to just trying to do things quickly and make you happy. And I wonder if some of that exists with Kyer Elam, because if you go to a training camp practice, you're going to see Kyer Elam is one of the first guys on the field. He's very dialed in during practice. He's very rigid. He's repped hard. He stays late every single day. There's a lot of time that he's putting into this. In fact, you know, he was the guy that uh, wanted the playbook on the flight to Buffalo when, right after he got drafted, right? We only remember those stories. And I think he's trying really, really hard to the point where he's just not playing loose. He's not playing free. He's not playing like himself. And maybe there's a lot of pressure that he feels being a first round pick, wanting to win this job. There's some legit competition, of course, with Christian Benford and Dane Jackson. And he's just pressing and not playing natural and not playing loose. And that's not allowing him to be the best version of himself. And so I, I, I think that, you know, maybe that story hits home for you. It did for me as I try to perceive what's going on here with, with Kyer Elam. Uh, now, as for your question about his biggest weaknesses on college tape, um, I went back and read my scouting report. I had written down run support, tackling, and projecting him to zone coverage uh, because he didn't have much experience doing that at Florida. And I would say, based on what we've seen so far in the NFL, he's actually been better at tackling and run support than I had anticipated. But I think the biggest issue has simply been trusting his technique. And so trusting the technique of, of what zone he's supposed to cover and what the leverage of the defense is supposed to accomplish, trusting his athleticism to mirror and match patterns in, in man and not you know in, concede leverage where he doesn't have help. It's, it's that stuff. It's, it's athletic confidence and trusting his technique and trusting the scheme uh, that he's going to be where he's supposed to be. I think that's the biggest issue. So appreciate the question from Scott. And hopefully uh, what I was able to share there um, was helpful for people to perhaps interpret what's going on with Kyer Elam. Uh, and last thing I'll say about Kyer Elam is that he is 22 years old. He's a year and a half younger than Dalton Kincaid. And so maybe it doesn't happen this year. Maybe, you know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's Dane Jackson, kind of the guy there, primarily opposite of uh, Trey White. And we've seen a platoon quite a bit through out the years under Sean McDermott with this football team, literally three of the last six years, I thought you saw a true platoon at CB2. I'm not sure this year uh, will be any different, uh, but he's still a very young player. You know, Maybe he doesn't start till next year. And certainly I, you can be very concerned about the trajectory, of course. I, I mean, I am too, uh, but let's not let's not close the book on Kyrie Elam quite yet. 
The next one here comes from Dean. Dean says, if Spencer Brown happens to continue on this path, what is plan B for right tackle early in the season? Would we be better to take a shot on Ryan Vandemark, even though he's not as comfortable there, or are we better to move Ryan Bates, who is not a natural tackle, but more of a utility player? Or do we look at a, a plan C altogether with somebody new? No, I think realistically, your your situation at right tackle is number one, Spencer Brown, hoping that he is able to you know take that big step this year. And then I think you look at David Questenbury and Ryan Vandemark as your primary backups at offensive tackle. At least that's the way I see it right now. And between them, you consider which one gives you the best chance to to be the answer at at tackle. You know, David Questenbury has NFL experience, which probably is going to give him the nod. You know, Vandermark has the upside, uh, and you know maybe he's earning that opportunity as well. As far as Ryan Bates goes, you know I think the issue with Ryan Bates is if the offensive line. Uh, the ones that the Bills roster are the ones that I think they're going to be. Ryan Bates is going to be the only other guy that um, has experience snapping. And so I'm not sure that you're going to want to put him in a position where uh, he's starting for you. And now you're really kind of twisted up if you have an injury to Mitch Morse. Um, and so I think, I think Ryan Bates' versatility is probably going to keep him out of that that conversation, to be honest with you. I think it'll be Questenbury unless Vandemark really shows that he's comfortable taking that role. And so I think that's the reality of, of the entire situation. All right, folks, buying tickets to your favorite events, it should not be stressful, but you know what? Sometimes it is. That's why you got to check out Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. And with killer deals on last-minute tickets and the best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting excited for the fun you're going to have. Folks, the Game Time app is awesome. They have flash deals. They have last-minute tickets. They give you images of seat views, great prices. The app is super easy to navigate. So many great features. I love that you get the images of the seats so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And then they also send them directly to your phone so you don't got to dig through emails. You get those tickets right away. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The next one today comes from Dan. Dan says, is it true that most defensive line coaches and coordinators attack the weakest point of an offensive line? If so, how did it play out last year with both Roger Saffold and Spencer Brown struggling at times? If the struggles continue for Spencer Brown, could you see defensive coordinators scheming heavier on the right side against Brown compared to last year? Is that good or bad? Seems like it might be easier for Dorsey with only one weakness as opposed to two. Yeah, really good point here. That's definitely the plan. If you're a defensive coordinator, you are trying to figure out um, who the weak links are on the offensive line, and you want to attack them, right? That's definitely part of the equation. And last year, um, one if you guys remember, one of the things that I talked a lot about with Buffalo Bills pass protection issues last year was I said, look, sometimes guys miss blocks and lose and lose one-on-one -on -one battles. That definitely happens. But I said, look, I think the protection schemes broke down just as often uh, that led to pressure and sacks. And, and I think that's the best way that I can tell you that teams were able to really stress both Roger Saffold and Spencer Brown. And I think the important application for us to consider as we talk about the 2023 Buffalo Bills is that this right side of the offensive line is going to be challenged. You know, you have Spencer Brown, who I think we all perceive as the weak link of the offensive line, and he's playing next to a rookie, you know, Osiris Torrance. And for as optimistic as we are about Osiris Torrance, He's a rookie, and teams know that, and they're going to stress him. They're going to make him think. They're going to give him different looks and really challenge whether or not he knows assignments and what his timing is. And so that's definitely something to be extremely mindful of for Ken Dorsey and you know where you're going to want to help, right? Your, your best class blockers are probably Mitch Morse and Connor McGovern. That's a pretty stable situation. Deion Dawkins at left tackle is a pretty stable situation. And so you're going to want to help on that right side with your chippers, right? Your pass blocking with your backs. That's where they're going to want to focus. And there's the other 
layer to this entire conversation that teams know uh, how good Josh Allen is rolling to his right. And so you're going to have some, some situations here where they may overload that side and really try to not only stress Torrance and Brown, but really take away Josh Allen's ability to get outside and say, hey, if you're getting outside the pocket, you're doing it either going forward or you're going to your to the left there. And so you can definitely see this as a major uh, possible concern for the Bills offense and how they execute in 2023, of course, uh, unless Brown and, and Torrance really answer the bell there and um, and really secure that right side. Next one here comes from Chris. Chris says, missed tackles on defense has been an issue over the last couple of years with Tremaine, one of the team's few sure tacklers gone and a switch to a more attack style defense. Where do you see the missed tackle rate being this season? Is that a cause for concern? Thank you for the pot. Yeah, Chris, I, I am concerned about that. I've talked about missed tackles for a number of years on this podcast and um, Tremaine Edmonds has been historically one of the best tacklers on the team. You know, Jordan Poyer as well, another very good tackler. And so losing your best tackler definitely hurts uh, when you have issues year over year with missed tackles. And I think you make a good point, you know, and you've even heard this in the past that part of the reason that the Bills had missed tackles is that they're an up the field defense. And that's just part of what comes with it. Well, now you're talking about being more aggressive. And so I think that's uh, definitely something to monitor. And unless there has been collective growth from individual players who have historically not tackled well, I am very worried that this can continue to be a problem. I think some of the biggest, you know, the most guilty offenders of missed tackles for the Bills has been Trey White, has been Matt Milano. I love those players. I love them. All right. But they definitely have way too many missed tackles. Even the defensive line, you see a lot of missed tackles from that group as well. And so. Yeah, this this defense, if if they're going to have the success they want to in 2023, becoming a better collective tackling group is going to be absolutely essential. Next one here comes from Jeff. Jeff says, on the Part of My Take podcast, Von Miller said that Eric Washington is the best defensive line coach that he's ever had. I've always felt disappointed in Washington because of the assets he's been given and underachieving for expectations. What makes a good defensive line coach? I also realize I have blinders on because I only really focus on Bills players being developed, so it may seem substantial for us, but maybe minuscule compared to other teams around the league and what they get out of their assets. Also, who were Von Miller's other defensive line coaches? Good question, Jeff, and I see a lot of cr criticism for Eric Washington, and um, when he was promoted to assistant head coach, people were very confused by that, and um, I, I, when that happened, I, I addressed it on the podcast. And so I want to revisit some of the things that I brought up then. And obviously I think with a position coach, you're going to um, evaluate them based on how their unit performs. And I think collectively there may be some disappointment out there for how the bills defensive line has performed relative to the investments that have been made there. Um, it's, it's also curious to me that the bills year over year have top three defenses and everyone's disappointed with the most important part of it, which is the defensive line. So they must be doing something okay there for them to have uh, consistently, you know, such high ranking defenses. But I think so many people really think that Eric Washington is a bad defensive line coach because Boogie Basham and AJ Epinesa, like, is that your criteria? What are you pointing to? Because I look at Eric Washington's career and I see a lot of very good defensive linemen going back to the Panthers 2011 to 2017, developing the likes of Charles Johnson, Greg Hardy, Mario Addison, who was a practice squad pick off, pick up off of like the Washington practice squad, turned him into a really good player. Frank Alexander had some really good seasons. Kawan Short uh, became one of the best defensive tackles in the league under Eric Washington. Starlo Talele early in his career was really good. Coney Ely um, was another guy that I think – even maybe exceeded some expectations based on where he was drafted. Same thing with Greg Hardy, who I already mentioned with the bills. Um, you know, everybody talks about Basham and Ebenezer, but Harrison Phillips uh, developed and got a nice deal to go to Minnesota. Greg Rousseau is on a great path. Uh, Jordan Phillips has clearly placed his best football with the Buffalo bills compared to what he was able to deliver for the Cardinals and dolphins. Even Shaq Lawson came back to the bills right after being over, you know, Miami said, get out of here after one season. Texans didn't want to keep him. The Jets didn't want to keep him. He comes back to Buffalo and he's a reasonable player. Um, 
I would say Daquan Jones just had the best year of his career under Eric Washington at Oliver. Um, I know that maybe he's not everything that everybody wants him to be, but he's on a nice path and the bills you know, committed a lot of money to him. So who are the disappointments? Well, I guess Trent Murphy has been a disappointment, but he was coming off the ACL and never was the same and never got another opportunity after Buffalo. Boogie Basham, we'll see, but I like what I've seen from him in camp and preseason. Maybe we're disappointed in A.J. Epinesa. The guy had six and a half sacks last year in a part-time role, and I like the trajectory that he's on. So what is it Vernon Butler? And He's just always been bad. I don't know. I, I think that – I think Eric Washington – at least through the way that a lot of Bills fans perceive him, I think he might be underrated. I mean, Von Miller told you he's the best defensive line coach he ever had. And I know Von Miller's positive about everything, right? But he didn't have to say that. And as for Von Miller's other defensive line coaches, uh, 2011, he had Wayne Nunnally. Uh, it was actually his last year as a defensive line coach. He had spent 13 years prior with the Saints and Chargers. And then in 2012 through 2014, Jay Rogers was his defensive line coach, who is currently with the Chargers as their D-line coach and run game coordinator with Brandon Staley. 2015 to 2021, he had Bill Kolar. I think Bill Kolar is generally regarded as one of the better defensive line coaches in the NFL, uh, was a D-line coach in the league from 1990 to 2022, uh, coached Von Miller, coached J.J. Watt, uh, some big names along the way there. For Bill Kolar, and then in 2021, uh, Eric Henderson. So that, I guess that's who Eric Washington is being measured up against, and at least through the lens of, of Von Miller. Uh, Jeff also had a follow-up question. He said, I've seen people talk about replacing Mitch Morse for the past three years, and I don't get it. If you have an opportunity, can you just give us a quick breakdown on why Mitch is so consistently solid and why he is so pivotal? In my eyes, he's the most underrated player on the Bills. You know, Jeff, I've seen this a lot too. I find it very, very strange. I can tell you with a great amount of confidence that the Buffalo Bills love Mitch Morse. And I don't really understand some of this conversation that I've seen. I wonder if it's contract driven, right? Because there's been some opportunities with Mitch Morse's contract where you might look at it and say, hey, the Bills got a chance here. If they want to move on from Mitch Morse, they can save some money. Well, you still got to get a starting center and they love Mitch Morse. So that's never been much of a reality that they're going to move on from him. Um, and I wonder if some of that is people are always concerned about like concussions with Mitch Morse. Uh, he has a history of concussions, but look at his career. He's been really durable for the bills. I think he's only missed a handful of games maybe uh, throughout his time. And so, you know, Mitch Morse has even spoken very openly about concussions and, you know, he, he has a lot of confidence in how he's been treated. And he said that he's going to be fine. And if he has another concussion, he'll be fine. And if he has another one after that, he's going to be fine. And so I, I just, there's a disconnect here for sure. Uh, Mitch Morse, very high quality center, was a pro bowler last year, an original ballot pro bowl selection. Uh, he's outstanding in pass protection. One of the best pass blocking centers in the entire NFL. He's got outstanding range in the run game. And so if you're looking for a guy that can get out in space, climb to the second level, lead block uh, around the perimeter, he can do that for you at an extremely high level. Now, what he's not is a people mover, right? He's not going to have a nose tackle on top of him, and drive him out of the way, right? That's the one thing that he doesn't really give you, but he's a good positional blocker, elite pass blocker, outstanding range, and a guy that uh, I think will be the Bills center for a number of years to come. All right, we got some good stuff coming up. Just need a quick break. Stick with me. I'll be right back. The next one today comes from Ray. Ray says backup quarterback is officially a problem. Thinking back to 2018 when Roger Goodell went up to the podium and said, with the seventh overall pick, the Buffalo Bills select Josh. It seems like time stopped for a moment, and a lot of us wanted him to say Rosen and not Allen. Obviously, we are glad he did say Allen, but is it time to start looking back at 2018 quarterbacks like Josh Rosen to fill the backup role? Trading for Darnold or Mason Rudolph would seem like a lot, but what are your thoughts on those three? Well, first of all, yeah, good thing we were all wrong about Josh Rosen, right? The guy's been on seven different teams since he's been drafted. Um, I don't think he's it, right? I don't think he's a guy that sh you should be considering for a backup job. Um, he's currently a free agent, and so I don't think anybody wants this guy, and so I'm not super interested either. And he's been on teams that have needed quarterbacks, and he's not like getting opportunities. So I think I think he's done. I, I think it's over for Josh Rosen. 
Uh, as for Sam Darnold, he's been announced as the San Francisco 49ers number two quarterback over Trey Lance, who they traded three first round picks to get. And so I think they're pretty happy to hold on to him, especially with Brock Purdy, their starter coming off of the elbow injury. He's played well in preseason. I think Sam Darnold's going to be uh, the backup in San Francisco. And we know Kyle Shanahan quarterbacks get hurt all the time. So I'm guessing that Sam Darnold is going to start some for them. Now, Mason Rudolph, I could definitely see. I I have plenty of reason to believe that the Bills liked Mason Rudolph back in that, uh, that 2018 draft. I think there were scenarios where if the Bills could not trade up for Josh Allen, that with that first first-round pick at number 11, that they would pick Tremaine Edmonds. And then with that second pick, which was like 21, 22, something like that, they may have taken Mason Rudolph. And so I, I could definitely see um, the Bills having interest in Mason Rudolph should he become available. And with Kenny Pickett uh, as a starter in Pittsburgh and Mitch Trubisky locked in as a number two, if they don't want to roster three quarterbacks, and Mason Rudolph could be available. And I can definitely see that as a player the Bills uh, would pursue. All right, we got some more stuff to get to here, but uh, would first like to remind you about the Locked On Bills subtext community, something that we started offering a few months ago, and it has been awesome, especially through training camp and preseason. And I'm very excited for what it's going to be like during the regular season. And so if you want to check it out, there's a link in the show notes for today. Um, and there's a link in the show notes every day that you can click on and check it out. Yeah, here's what you get. You get one-on-one -on -one text conversations with me. So I'll be a text message away, direct line to me, talk Bills football whenever you want to. I've loved that component of it. Uh, talking Bills football is what I do. And so I love the opportunity to text with everybody. You get priority when it comes to herd mentality, some exclusive content. I send pretty much every day at least one uh, regular text to kind of just give updates on the show, updates on some things that I'm thinking about with the Bills. Um, you get my first reaction to all Bills news. So whenever something happens with the team, I send out uh, my thoughts to the subtext community. Uh, so check it out. It's been really fun. I'll also be uh, doing live texts during the games. Uh, we tried that out last week, and it was really cool. And so. Uh, as I'm watching the Bears game on Saturday, I'll be sending out some live thoughts as well through the subtext community. So check it out. There's a link in today's show notes to join. Uh, next one here comes from John. John says, given the lack of tackle depth, do you think Bean signs Bobby Hart to the 53 if the Lions cut him? I'm sorry it's come to this. I wouldn't rule it out. Um, the Bills like familiarity. Obviously, they have some time with Bobby Hart. So I can see that as an option for sure. Um but at the same time, you're going to roster him over Questenbury or Ryan Vandemark. And, like, is Bobby Hart better than those players? I'm certainly not moving on from Vandemark for Bobby Hart. Maybe David Questenbury? I don't know. I probably have more comfort in David Questenbury than I do Bobby Hart. So I think it's a possibility, but I'm, I'm not hopeful. I'd rather have Questenbury and Vandemark. Uh, next one here comes from Dennis. Dennis says, as we approach 2023, I do have my concerns about the Bills' defense. If we choose to ignore how Joe Burrow dissected them in the playoffs, where do we stand now? It seems Poyer and Hyde are aging, beat up, and could not be one, what they once were. Trey White at CB1 seems injury unproven and not the same player. CB2 is a crapshoot. Middle linebacker is poised to be devoured by opposition. Is Von Miller the savior? Considering his age and injuries, who knows? How many points does Josh and the offense need to score to overcome these discrepancies? I project the Bills at 9-8. and eight. What do you think? Well, I, I think against Cincinnati, if you're kind of looking at it through that lens, surely Von Miller helps. Daquan Jones helps, who didn't play in that game. More defensive line depth helps, right? Jordan Phillips tried to play with like one arm in that game. You got Puna Ford. You got Leonard Floyd uh, on this defensive line as well, so you're much deeper there. I think having Micah Hyde helps, right? He didn't play in that Bengals game. You have Trey White further removed from the injury. That's probably helpful. Jordan Poyer was concussed in that Bengals game. I'm sure that'll be helpful to have him healthy and ready to go. Uh, not having Tremaine Edmonds is going to hurt for sure, but you have to keep in mind that's also the first time the Bills played Joe Burrow. Uh, I think they'll be better suited for the next go round. Um, I think nine and eight would be an absolute floor for the football team. I'm not going to sit here and say that there's not a, a world where the Bills can go nine and eight, but I think that's probably the absolute floor of what is possible. But I don't really share a lot of the concerns that you do. I mean, why Why are we talking about Hyde and Poyer being washed up? There's no evidence of that. Their best season together was 2021. And the only reason 2022 wasn't just as good is because Hyde was hurt. The Poyer was hurt. I mean, Hyde was an all-pro in 2021. Poyer was an all-pro last year. Both guys take great care of themselves. I don't really see that as a valid talking point. 
And so I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negativity and dooms doomsday perspective in in the way that you approach this question. Um, and I think that there's plenty that you can extrapolate out of the context of what happened in Cincinnati, especially on defense, and realize that yeah, it's not just the same thing. Copy paste. Go play the Bengals again. The Bills are different at literally every spot defensively up front, more depth plus Von Miller plus a healthy Jordan Phillips second level. Obviously I don't think that's going to be nearly as good without Tremaine Edmonds, but to sit here and dismiss the idea that Hyde and Poyer can't continue to play at a high level and that Trey white can't be better than he was last year. And that the options at CB two aren't better equipped to perform better given that they've had another year of experience. I, I don't know. I don't get it. I think you're, I think you're missing you're missing some key talking points and clinging to a lot of negativity to come to that conclusion. All right, folks, that is going to do it for us here today on the podcast. We'll be back again for you tomorrow. We're going to get ready for the Bills Bears preseason game. Very curious to hear from Sean McDermott on what the plan is for the starters. And we can then kind of, once we know that, we can talk about what's going to go down. So uh, come on back for that tomorrow. Would love for you to join me on Bleacher Report as well. Like I talked about at the beginning of the show, download the app. You can find me at uh, Joe underscore Marino. Going to be on there quite a bit here in the coming months. So would love for you to follow around, follow along. Would also love for you to take a moment to share, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. Look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.